everybody, welcome to Brave at Home. This is our last service of the year and we're at home. So uh, we just thought it'd be awesome to give all of our, our volunteers, our staff, everybody that serves us all year long with um, all the services and everything behind the scenes, the holiday weekend off to be with their family. And so wherever you're joining us from, where I hope hopefully you're somewhere comfy, you're in your PJs, you're watching in a living room, uh, maybe you're out doing something fun, watching on a phone, I don't know. In fact, post from where you're watching from. We'd love to see where you're watching from. Tag Brave Church, we'll repost you. It'd be just a, a fun way for us to stay connected as we're, we're we're separate watching from home today. Uh, but yeah, so we're here, you know, in years past, we've always done this kind of in a sterile environment in, a, in like a studio setting or something where we just kind of record the message. And I just thought it'd be fun to try it this year with like real people having a real service yeah. in a living room. And so we've got some people here today. How you guys doing? Woo! All right. And uh, the only rule to get in was no shoes. So everybody's got, you know, hopefully we're good. Saul's dream come true. Uh, <laughs> no shoes and no socks. So there we go. Uh, but today's message is a word that I really feel God put on my heart for the end of the year. And uh, when we look back on 2023 uh, and you think about your life or even the life of our church, like there's highlights and there's lowlights. There's some things that we can celebrate, that we can take joy in. Uh, maybe you had uh, the birth of a child. Maybe you got married. Maybe you had a, some great accomplishments at work. When I think about our church, I think about some of the just amazing days we've had from like Orange Fest, Snow in the Bay, Easter Fest, just all these awesome days. I also think about Brave Church San Francisco joining Brave Church, and that it's just been amazing. Let's give a hand uh, for Brave Church San Francisco. We love you. Uh, but all these all these highlights also come with lowlights. There are things that have happened. There have been days in our lives that, if we're honest, we don't really want to remember. We don't really want to reflect on right now. We kind of just want to move past them because they're, they, they weren't good, right? Whether they were painful, whether they were hard. And these are the days we'd like to leave behind us because these days represent the storms that we have faced. We've all had some storms. We've all been through some. So maybe you're in one right now. When I, when I think about my life in the last six months, uh, my family had some storms, okay? We lost the patriarch of our family, my grandpa Bill. Uh, he'd always been there, you know, a phone call away. And now now he's gone. He's in a better place. His legacy lives on. But, but the loss, the grief of loss is still real because death is a storm. Um, shortly after we experienced new life and we celebrated the birth of our fourth and final baby, Bianca Joanne Laws. And that's that's been brought so much joy into our life. But how many of you know having a newborn is also a storm, right? <laughs> Life with a newborn is a storm, okay? Within a week of her birth, we were um, in the process of setting our church budget for the upcoming year. While on paternity leave, I realized, okay, like the layoffs are affecting our giving. There's, there's more going on, right? And so within a week of her being born, I was back at work having to have some difficult conversations and um, having to let some people go. And that wasn't fun. Layoffs are a storm. Right? Maybe some of you lost your job this year. All throughout the Bay Area, people have been experiencing the reality of our economy changing. And so that's a storm. Um, then Pastor Marcy came back to work a few months later, and that just created a new storm for our family because there's a newborn, there's new expectations, there's new requirements, and uh, really just a lot of strain on us. And so sometimes marriage can be a storm, right? And so what's your storm? What's a storm that you're facing today or one that you've been through maybe recently and you're, you're still evaluating it, you're still trying to make sense of it? I don't know what I don't know, right? But I do know this, that you can find hope in every storm. There is hope in every storm when you go through it with Jesus. And so today we're gonna go to Genesis looking at a story of a biblical character named Joseph. And Joseph's life, had some pretty big storms. And so we're actually gonna look at three storms that Joseph faced and three lessons that we can learn in the storm, okay? When you're, uh, we're gonna be in Genesis chapter 37, but before you go there, let me just tell you a little bit about Joseph. Joseph is actually one of the most respected characters in the Bible. Uh, there are a lot of great characters in the Bible, but aside from Jesus himself, uh, he is the only biblical character in the Old Testament that they didn't record any sins. Like, it's like there's no record of him doing wrong. Now, obviously, Jesus is the only one who is sinless, 
But it's interesting to note that this guy was so great that everything that he's known for is his character, is his his faithfulness to God. He was just a really, really good guy. And so, you know, when you read the Bible, you quickly realize that scripture doesn't sugarcoat anything, right? Most of the great biblical characters are actually known for the things they did, but also for their huge weaknesses and their huge mistakes because they're they were human. And so in our culture, it's kind of interesting because we often really relate to people because of their shared weakness, right? When they share from a place of vulnerability or the things that they go through that are hard, it makes us feel more comfortable because vulnerability is relatability. When we say, oh, she's just like me, or he deals with that too. Uh, But you know, did you know that that's not all we need? We actually need more than relatability. We need more than just a connectedness around weaknesses. Sometimes we actually need to be inspired. Every now and then there are people who come along and they aren't perfect, but the best thing we get from them isn't, oh, you too, it's I can too. Like if God's, if the power of God can do that in your life, then he could do that in my life. It's inspiration. So full disclosure, Joseph isn't a great example of weakness. The guy was just rock solid, but that doesn't mean his life was easy. And he's an example of finding hope in the midst of a storm and uh, an example of someone where we can go, man, if, if God can bring him through that, he can bring me through that. So Joseph was a lot like Jesus, um, um, amazingly faithful, amazingly charactered, but he's been through some stuff. And so we're gonna look at these storms together. Um, the story of Joseph, it starts off like this. Joseph was his father's favorite and he had many brothers, And Joseph's dad loved him so much and favored him so much, he gave him a special gift, which was basically like putting a a bullseye on his back. He gave him this like bright, vibrant coat of many colors that they would all be jealous of. It reminds me of the episode in The Office where they're doing a gift swap and uh, the the limit's 30 bucks and Michael Scott puts an iPod (laughs) and they all fight over it. (laughs) Okay, it's kind of like that. Except, you know, Joseph's dad wasn't trying to mess things up, but the sibling rivalry was already there. It was already bad. This just made it worse. And then Joseph decides to tell them his dream, a dream that he had from God in Genesis 37, verse eight. It says, his brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he said. So Joseph's brothers are are mad, they're upset, they wanted him out of their lives. And instead of deciding to kill him, they decide, well, we could at least get something from him, right? We can get some good money for his life. So they sell him into slavery. Can you imagine how traumatic this would be for Joseph? Your own family, your own brothers turn against you Okay, and they, and they sell him into slavery. Now let's pause for a minute and think about this because this is a pretty big storm, right? When you think about what a person could go through in their life, this is a pretty big one. And so if you're Joseph, you're a kid, you're loved, you're cherished, next thing you know, you're no longer free. You're living in a stranger's house in a strange land. At this point in the story, if Joseph never amounted to anything, we would all understand. If Joseph became a a victim, if he took on some addictions, if he just got depressed, whatever he does to cope with the injustice that's happened to him would be understandable to us, right? And so we'd almost expect him to have some issues. And yet he's this example of somebody that weathered through it all so well. His life goes in a completely unlikely direction. Despite his misfortune, Joseph thrives. And now we don't know the whole story um, about Joseph and his dad's relationship, but here's something that we do know, and I think this is really significant. There would have been no doubt in Joseph's mind that he had his father's blessing. Uh, One of the things this story reveals is just how powerful that is. It anchored Joseph's life. We've all heard phrases when people go in the opposite direction, like father wounds and father issues. And we've seen the stats and the effects on being fatherless. Okay, and you might be listening right now and you've never met your earthly father or you just have a really strained relationship or, or a terrible relationship with your dad. But let me tell you some good news. Joseph had his father's blessing, but whether you had that or not, Joseph's story shows us the more important thing, the greater blessing that is available to every single one of us. And that is our father God's blessing. So look what happens in Genesis 37. It says, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. 
The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Well, when his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in, the, in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. With Joseph in charge, he didn't concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Okay, so Joseph was like a good hire, right? And so Joseph knew that he had his father's earthly blessing. He knew his dad, Jacob, cherished him. But, he, but when all of that was stripped away, when that, when that relationship was completely taken out of his life, he learned something more important. He started to learn about his father God's blessing. See, if we're faithful to Jesus, we have God's blessing. And so if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Three lessons from the storm. Even in the middle of a storm, when your life doesn't feel so blessed, when you've made a big mistake and you're not sure how you're going to recover, even when your boat has been rocked, the first lesson we learn is this. Number one, blessed ships don't sink. Blessed ships don't sink. Joseph's life had been incredibly devalued, but he continued to live from a place of blessing. He continued to live a blessed life. Even when the storm is raging, he doesn't cave under pressure. Verse three, it says, the Lord gave him success in everything he did. I wonder if you felt like your ship is sinking at different points this last year. I, I sure have, okay? I'll never forget the fear I felt. There was this situation where our, our third daughter, Elia, she was only a year and some change at this point, And she, I, I gave her some food that she had a reaction to. And the next thing you know, it's like she's choking, but there's nothing in there. She's wheezing. So I'm like, oh my gosh, she's, she's having an allergic reaction. And so I put her in the car and, you know, Marcy had to stay behind with the other kids. So I'm, I'm going by myself. And I don't know if this has ever happened to you when there's something happening with your little one in a car seat, but you're driving, so you can't even reach them. You can't even help them. And you just like, I just heard her choking. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, like, what if something really bad happens and I can't even reach her and I just got to get to the hospital? Like you feel very helpless, right? And so then we get to the hospital, we rush her in and um, they, they, they put her on this bed and, and then they put an oxygen mask on her. And it's like the weirdest thing, seeing like a little thing with an oxygen mask. And so they gave her some medicine that calmed the reaction down. And fortunately she was okay. And uh, they observed her for a while. So basically at like by 5 a.m. the next day, she's back at home and she's in bed and everything is okay. And I just feel relieved. But on the way home from the hospital, as, as the sun's coming up, you know, I, I had a moment where I was just reflecting on that experience, like reflecting on what just happened. And I remember just, just thinking about how freaked out I was. And on one hand, it's natural, right? Like this is my child, this is my baby, I'm concerned. On the other hand, in the heat of the moment, I felt alone. I felt helpless. In my mind, in my heart, it was all up to me. When you forget that even in the scariest moments, God is with you, the scary becomes even scarier, okay? I had lost God's perspective. I, I wasn't even praying, which is kind of weird. I'm a pastor, right? Like I was so afraid that I wasn't even praying when that's like the only thing I could do. <laughs> I was so focused on the storm, I forgot who was in the boat with me. Has your storm ever caused you to forget who's with you? Has your storm ever caused you to lose sight of the blessing? Let's take, let's take a moment right where you're seated Wherever you're at, we're gonna pause and reflect right now. I want you to picture your storm. What comes to mind? What is it? Can you, can you name this storm? Is it your marriage? Is it a relationship? Is it fear of getting sick? Is it a health issue that you have? Is it a job? Is it your finances? Is it your kids? Is it your future? Is it your parents? Is it a living situation? Go ahead and visualize your storm. Name it. Call it out. There's power in naming something. There's power in knowing what it is. And then I want you to close your eyes with me. Wherever you're at, just close your eyes with me. And I want you to imagine that you're standing there facing it, but you are not alone because Jesus is with you. He's right there in your boat. It's rocking around, but he's right there with you. And Jesus says to the storm, be quiet and the waves are still, and the storm ceases. 
and you remember who is greater than the storm and that blessed ships don't sink. Now let's take a look at our next storm. Okay, just as we're, we're getting comfortable, Joseph's life's starting to look pretty good. It's like it's a turnaround story, right? Then one day, he goes into Potiphar's house, he goes into his master's house, and uh, the, there's nobody there except his wife. Everybody just say, oh no. Oh no. Oh no, here comes trouble, this isn't good. What, what does she do next? She tries to seduce him. And she was a bad person. Okay, Joseph was wise not to trust her. He's a good guy, so what does he do? He runs, but as he's running out, she grabs his cloak, pulls it from him, and so then she starts screaming, and she lies about what's happening. It looks really bad, right? Because she's got his jacket. In verse 14, it says, she says, uh, look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. And then she goes and she tells her husband this story. And it says he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in, the, in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Uh, this was not fair, right? Joseph was unfairly accused. He's being dealt consequences that he didn't deserve. He's probably, he's probably going, what is up with my life? Like my brothers throw me in a pit. Now I'm just when things are going good, this happens. Ha has that ever happened to you? Like something that was just totally unfair that blindsided you. And so this guy can't catch a break. And the lesson we learned from this storm is number two, when life isn't fair, we can still find favor. When life isn't fair, we can still find favor. Joseph looked guilty. He looked like a bad guy, even though he had actually just passed a test of faithfulness. He stayed loyal to his master. Sometimes the storm is our character being challenged. Sometimes it's a test and, and passing a test. Sometimes it's, it's failing and getting back up and repenting. Whenever you have to make hard decisions, there are gonna be people that disagree with you or don't like you. You're not always gonna make everyone happy. And if you've ever led anything, you know this. If you're a parent, you know this. If you're responsible for making important decisions at work, you know this. And so on the receiving end, on the other side of this, when we're not the one making the decisions, we all know what it's like to not be happy with not getting what we want or when we don't agree. And so this has been a, our cultural moment as a country for the last few years. A whole bunch of people are really angry because they're not getting what they want. And so the world is angry and we have to be careful what we do with our feelings because that's the climate around us. That's what we live in. When we talk about the spiritual climate, there's a counter climate that we're choosing to bring into the environment, that we're choosing to bring into our communities, into our homes and into our workplaces. And it's not anger. So when we feel wronged, when it doesn't feel fair, when we feel misunderstood, we have to remember that our favor doesn't come from people. Our future doesn't come from people. It comes from God. Yeah. And so he's still in control of the outcome. Continuing on, it says, but while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him and he showed him kindness and he granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So ultimately, this unfair situation puts Joseph in proximity to some really influential people, okay? The cupbearer and the chief baker, people that interacted with Pharaoh, who was ruler of the whole land. And so when they ran into a situation where nobody could interpret the Pharaoh's dream, they thought of Joseph because Joseph had interpreted some dreams for them while he was in prison. And so God, uh, he reveals the meaning of Pharaoh's dream to Joseph, allows him to interpret it. And this gives him huge favor with Pharaoh but it also does something else because this dream was about what was coming, that there would be seven years of prosperity and then there would be seven years of famine. And so Joseph knew what to do. Joseph was good at managing things. Joseph was a good steward. And so now Joseph is elevated to a position where he's in charge of all of Egypt. So let's recap. He goes, he goes from being sold into slavery, then he becomes a ruler of Potiphar's house. Then he's falsely accused, thrown in prison, but then he becomes ruler over all of Egypt. Who's in control of this situation, mm -hmm. right? Not the evil one, not the people that are out to get him, not the people that are lying about him. No, God is still in control. So what have we learned so far? Blessed ships don't sink. When life isn't fair, we can still find favor. And lastly, with God, 
the hardest years can bear the most fruit. When the famine swept the land back home, Joseph's family, they ran out of food. And so they had to go looking for food. And so they went uh, in search of help. And at first they didn't recognize Joseph. Like he was the one with all the food, right? He held it all back. He saw it coming. And so they go there and they're standing right before Joseph. And in their moment of greatest need, they're standing in front of the person they've most greatly betrayed. And here's what Joseph says to them. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Joseph says, even though you're out to destroy me, God was at work, even in the context of your evil, to bring about something really good. Their evil was not God's will. It wasn't God's plan, but God is loving and powerful enough to work for good out of the worst situations. I love how uh, Joseph, he just saw the bigger picture. I mean, in this moment, this was like his big revenge moment, right? Like he could have been like, you guys did this to me, but look at me now. Like, look at where I am, look at where you are. But instead he makes it about, God put me here to save many lives. And you're just some of those lives that God also cares about. And it's a blessing to be in this position. So the legacy of Joseph is that God used him to save many souls. The legacy of Brave Church is that God is using us here in the Bay Area uh, to change the spiritual climate one person at a time, to save souls, to see many people find and follow Jesus. So when you see the greater purpose of your life, it's easier to forgive. It's easier to let go of your pain, to not be held back by it. Think of all the ways Joseph's pain and the injustices he experienced could have actually held him back Instead, they propelled him forward. Yeah. So listen, there, there have been some things this year that I have no doubt the enemy of your soul has intended to harm you. And, and maybe you've taken some hits. The Bible tells us who our real enemy is. It says in Ephesians, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We live in a war zone. That's what the Bible says, that we live in a world zone, that this world is a spiritual battlefield. We live in the midst of a cosmic fight between good and evil. And even though the ultimate victory has been decided when Jesus conquered the grave, there's still a long, brutal war until the final ending. And so just because we know who wins doesn't mean that we can be naive to the battle. Uh, a few months ago, we had a night, okay? Anybody have a night? Like you're just like, that was a night. Like that was crazy, okay? Here's how crazy it was. So Orange Fest is this huge, amazing community event. Uh, we did a trunk or treat against our better judgment with four little kids. So it was like a crazy event for us. We're like just surviving it. And we get home and we're exhausted. And I planned to speak at Brave Church San Francisco the next day. And Pastor Darren, my dad was speaking in the East Bay, but I really wanted to get out there and be with everybody, right? And so that's our plan. And right before we go to bed, my wife and I are talking about, wow, like we're exhausted. This is, this is big weekend. This has been a long day. Can't even imagine like anything more, right? So 2 a.m., we get a knock on the door to our house and it's a police officer. And I'm thinking, whoa, what's going on? Like, this is wild. Like, you got the wrong guy. No, I'm just kidding. And so that, so that, but then I'm just like, what is going on? And he says, I don't know how to tell you this. Your car got stolen. I'm like, what? So I'm like in a safe community, right? And I don't even know how they did it. Well, my wife left the keys in the car, but that's another story. We're not gonna, we're not gonna go there. It, it just doesn't happen though, right? This doesn't happen in our neighborhood. Like I, I talk to people that they've lived here like for 20 years and they've never seen a car get stolen, right? It happens, the police officer even told me like, we haven't seen this happen in months. And I'm like, of all the houses, of all the nights, of all the situations, my car gets stolen. Now we were up most of the night. Fortunately, they were able through the app on my phone, the Chevy app, they were able to track it. And so I helped them get the bad guys. Actually, they didn't get the bad guys. They only got my car, but they didn't get away with my car. So it was still a win. But, but I think about it like the next day and I'm, and, and I'm thinking, shoot, I've had no sleep. If there was ever a Sunday that I could just throw in the towel and be like, hey guys, just Pastor Darren's preaching in the East Bay. I'm not gonna make it out anymore. This is what happened. I could have done that. But then there was this sense of like, 
man, that just feels like I let them win. You know, like that just feels like the enemy yeah. wins. And there's moments where you need to hang back, right? Where that's the right thing to do. But there's other moments where you could actually miss a bigger win. And so now I look back on that attack. I look back on that situation. And that was one of the best Sundays of the year. That was one of the best experiences. It was like so much fun preaching, seeing people respond, seeing people's lives change. And I would have missed out on all of that if I shrunk back because it got hard. Mm -hmm. So what attack, what weakness, what storm in your life is an opportunity to see God do something powerful because in your weakness, you have no choice but to rely on his strength. When you're at the end of yourself, God does some of the most powerful things. The enemy of our souls doesn't want us uh, to access God's strength for us. He doesn't want us to see God move powerfully in our weakness. The enemy of our souls doesn't want us to recognize God's hand of favor moving in our lives when a few things aren't going well, okay? When we're in the trenches of a battle, he doesn't want us to think anything good could come of this. Apart from shipwrecking our faith, the greatest victory for the enemy is causing us to lose hope. 2023 was a year of battles, but it was also a year of planting seeds, seeds that will bear much fruit in this coming year. You may not see it now, but the harvest is coming. If you study how wine is made, it's the hardest years that produce the best grapes. Whether it be a drought, uh, extreme conditions, when the vine is stressed, the grapes, those grapes produce the best wine. And so when we're stressed, and our faith is tested, our trust in Jesus can go to a deeper level. You know, the, the hardest year could be the year that your relationship with God grew the most and you saw him move the most powerfully. With God, the hardest years bear the most fruit. So as we close, I wanna invite you wherever you're at to, to bow your heads, to close your eyes, to just to visualize, uh, to remove distractions and visualize what Jesus is wanting to say to you. Uh, maybe when you look back, there are some storms you faced this year and you were alone and you walked through them alone and, and you didn't turn to Jesus. Maybe there, maybe some of you, you did and that's, that's something you celebrate, but maybe, maybe there's some that you went through alone and Jesus would say to you right now, this year, let's do it different. This year, let me be with you. Let me be your strength. Maybe you need to turn to him right now. You don't have to face another storm again for the rest of your life without Jesus. If you accept his invitation to follow. And so for those of you here, and maybe you haven't decided to follow Jesus yet, and, and maybe today you receive that invitation for the first time, uh, we would love to hear from you. We would love to walk with you. I'm gonna pray a prayer. And all I want you to do is just agree with this prayer in your heart. Dear Jesus, today, I invite you into my boat. Today, I recognize that I cannot face these storms alone and I don't want to. Today, I make you Lord of my life and my savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, if you decided to follow Jesus for the first time, we would love to connect with you, to pray with you, to come alongside you. We'd love to see you at one of our services next Sunday. Uh, you can also let us know online and someone will reach out to you. But next Sunday is actually a big deal because it's our first Sunday back together in 2024. So we're having a kickoff Sunday. We're going to have free tacos. We're starting a new teaching series called How to Pray. Uh, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, maybe you've wondered, like, what is this prayer thing all about? How do I actually hear from God? How do I talk to God? So we're going to be talking about that next Sunday. Uh, if you've been following Jesus your whole life, don't, don't you know that like you just always want to hear God better? Isn't that just something that you could always grow in? So it's going to be a really great uh, series. Be there for the first week. And uh, But now we're going to finish with a time of worship. I just want to encourage you wherever you're at, turn up the music, get into it. Let's respond to this message, this teaching. Let's respond to this with a declaration that God is our firm foundation. Let's worship. is my first 
when everything around me is shaking. Oh, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So I'm saying 